Thank you for listening to the Book Brilliant Podcast. This is your host and founder, Matt. Today I have on Scott Horton. Scott Horton is an author, editor, radio host, and more. Uh, known most notably as a libertarian thinker and for his anti-war advocacy. Now, when you think anti-war, you may be thinking of some hippie listening to The Grateful Dead. Uh, but as you'll see here, that's not the case. As always, if you go to bookbrilliant.com and check out the show notes for this episode, every single book that we mentioned will be listed, which is great because there are a lot of them. Please enjoy. All right. Well, today I have on Scott Horton. Scott, uh, I really want to get into the books that made Scott Horton Scott Horton. So where, w- what books influenced you starting off as a, as a rebellious teenager? Oh, well, uh, if we're going back that far, of course, uh, 1984 and Brave New World and all of that stuff. <laughs> yes. Um, and then um, the first, I think the first serious nonfiction book I read was Out of Control by Leslie Coburn about Iran-Contra. Okay. Um, How old were you when you read that? Uh, I think that was in 10th grade, probably. Okay. And then, so I'm from Austin. And, um, so I guess as a lot of people know, it's kind of a liberal town in a, (laughs) and I grew up kind of right on the border of of Travis and Williamson County. And, you know, I think probably a lot of people maybe are another way, you know, and kind of take the worst of all, but there's a lot of libertarians that come from Austin. I think because, you know, there are a lot of people who can understand that right wingers make some good points, but the left wingers do too, kind of thing. Yeah. And so absolutely. you could end up being the worst of all worlds from that, you know what I mean? Or you could you could end up being a, a good libertarian. So I read, you know, a lot of the John Birch stuff, conspiracy stuff, none dare call it conspiracy and the creature from Jekyll Island. And I was a regular of the New American magazine and kind of the New World Order, one world government stuff. But I also read Peter Dale Scott and um, Michael Parenti and Noam Chomsky and you know their focus was much more on you know obviously American imperialism it's funny you know I can't remember the name of it anymore but there's a book by Michael Parenti where it's just perfect except for all the communist crap in it that makes no sense <laughs> whatsoever but all the rest of it is just great you know what I mean yeah so there's a lot that can be gained from from uh you know reading that kind of thing so I ended up um you know, I I was um, you could call them like the left wing conspiracists and the right wing conspiracists, and I was a libertarian interested in in what they were talking about. And then, you know, like in the nineties is what we're talking about, like high school through early twenties here, yes. basically era. Um, I didn't really read libertarians that much because, you know, I really respected Harry Brown, and of course, I worship Ron Paul, but I won't name names because I'm trying to be polite and not sectarian. But um, there's a certain libertarian magazine that people have heard of, you know, that uh, seemed to specialize in debunking all of the worst true accusations against the government. Like, for example, that they had betrayed the soldiers who had come home from Iraq War One, sick from Iraq War, you know, they called it Gulf War illness. Yeah. Really a lot of varied causes of it. But there were libertarians who were like, oh, look how skeptical we are. We're so very reasonable and skeptical. And that means that, you know, this is just a panic and it's not really true. And these guys, you know, um, they're not sick or out of proportion to the population and whatever, which is just really not right. And they showed how the anthrax vaccines, the anti-sarin uh, kind of um, uh, prophylactic anti-sarin nerve gas pills as well as just outright exposure to Iraqi chemical weapons that were detonated by the Americans in the yeah. desert in the aftermath of the war, uh, all led to a lot of illnesses uh, from American soldiers. And that was basically covered up at the time. And their libertarians were on the side of the regime. Yeah. It was yeah. the same thing for, again, Iraq. It was the effect of the sanctions on the Iraqi people, where... You know, the UN said it was 500,000 Iraqi children had died from the sanctions. And here are libertarians out front saying, oh, no, it couldn't possibly be that many. You know, don't worry about it. So my idea was, well, screw these libertarians. Like, I might be a libertarian. I'm culturally not a right winger. However, 
at least these right wingers care about the Branch Davidians. You know, at least these right wingers care about who helped McVeigh blow up that building and, yes. and who the FBI let get away with it. And at yes. least these right wingers, these right wing, you know, patriot yes. movement types, they care about the Iraqis. Yes. On, who are dying under the sanctions. While, yes. of course, a bunch of center left liberals and center right conservatives don't give a damn. But a bunch of kind of, you know, populist working class schlubs think it's very unfair how those people are being treated, you know. So. I kind of spent more of my time kind of palling around with right wingers during the 1990s. And I wasn't really a very online person during that time either. So it wasn't really until the run up to Iraq War II in 2002 and 2003 was when I finally got permanently high speed internet and stayed on it. And there was, that was how I found. I already had heard of antiwar.com before, but that was how I really started reading Justin Ramondo at antiwar.com. And then from there, I found LouRockwell.com. And there it's like, oh, here's a guy, speaking of Lou, the leader of the uh, chairman of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, yeah. who, who knows about all the same kind of conspiracy stuff as me, but he's not a kook and he's not all like, yes, yeah. Do he doesn't believe in it. He just knows this history, the true parts of it. But he yeah. would say, come on, one world government. The one world government is in Washington, D.C. The yeah. one world government is the U.S. Army based out of the pentagram, he would call it. You yeah. Know, and all this, the U.N. Brussels is going to come and take over america someday or some kind of thing um or or uh you know um so and then in the in the run-up to rock war ii it was really ramondo was the most important thing i was reading then the the regular writer the the head writer at antiwar.com because uh -huh. here here he's this right-wing libertarian you know kind of half buchananite yeah uh, half, you know more free market than pat but like very kind of curmudgeon -y, right wing reactionary anti-war you know the leader of anti-war.com is yeah. this archie bunker character although he was a big fag from san francisco he also was a a, a right winger from queens is what he wrote yeah so yeah. was it the articles or did he have books that you were reading specifically back then well yeah you know he has a book you know you'll you'll really get a kick out of this um got this reflection on it yeah reclaiming the american right okay yeah by by justin Ramondo, the lost legacy of the conservative movement so this is um his book that was originally written i think in 1993 and it's just great because it has a, a history of all of the first generation of the libertarian movement from right before world war ii and right after yeah um and you know sort of the before libertarians were called libertarians, um, yeah. so Albert J. Nock and Rose Wilder Lane and John T. Flynn and Garrett Garrett and uh, who am I leaving out? Um, and of course, Murray Rothbard. And then um, he uh, and then he also profiles the rise of the neoconservatives. And, oh. and Justin was really the best at showing how they're really a bunch of commies. And that's why they're so horrible and everything. And <laughs> we think of them as a species of conservative or even like, you know, in a way you could say like they're center left liberal hawks, but they kind of come from this these different traditions of mostly Trotskyite communism. That's the founder yeah. of the Red Army, you know, Lenin's partner. Um, and, you know, but it was estranged from Stalin, right? So it was convenient that these guys, well, if they're communists and they're Americans, it's convenient for them to be Trotskyites. That way they can still be American patriots and be anti Soviet Union, anti Stalin, but still be Reds, you know, and fit in in their neighborhood in a way kind of thing. Um, but then, you know, World War II has a lot to do with this because, you know, a lot changes after the war and, you know, the, the onset of the Cold War. And so yeah. you had these different factions of leftists who moved right then. Yeah. And so you had at National Review, see, this is what's funny, man. A lot of people don't really recognize this, that, you know, the National Review is the founders of the American conservative movement. They're really neoconservatives from the beginning. You know, um, William F. Buckley was never a leftist, but almost his entire staff was. And they fired all of the old right guys. Yeah. And, you know, they they banned anyone who had anything to do with the Birchers or Ayn Rand or Murray Rothbard and the Libertarians. Um, 
and, or and the racist too they kicked out but then who so who was left the only people who were left to write for them was james burnham and sydney hook and whitaker chambers and all these guys who were a bunch of reds but yeah. who had turned on the soviet union basically yes yeah. so now instead of hating war and hating central banking now the right is strictly about anti-communism and supporting the cold war against the soviet union led by a bunch of guys who were a bunch of reds in the first place yeah, I, you know what, what I like, uh, just to even take a step back is it's like what, what you had said about finding somebody who believes in the things that you do, but it sounds reasonable. That's how I feel with like Daryl Cooper or yourself. You know, when I was, when I was younger, like in high school, I had discovered Alex Jones. And when Alex Jones goes off on Piers Morgan, for the, for the people that know Alex Jones, they might think it's funny or they get it. But if that's your first time seeing Alex Jones, it's kind of hard to explain to somebody like, no, he's actually decent. Have you ever, on a side note real quick, did you have you ever had any interaction with Alex in Texas at all? You guys ever worked together or anything like that? Yeah, I used to know him and pal around with him a bit in the 1990s. I used to oh, do wow. a wow. show and stuff. Yeah, so... Um, that that was uh we'll go ahead did you have more you're gonna say there well i was just gonna say yeah not since then though okay not since not since 1999 i think was the last time i i had anything to do with that guy that's that's interesting so you know the 90s man that was back did you ever read like uh what was it called um on a pale horse why uh, was it william cooper, cooper? Yep. yeah 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 I mean, that was, i could have mentioned that that was one of my first kind of conspiracy books in high school that i read yeah, and I've got that one, and I've got, uh, I've got actually got. You can't see it in the screen, but I've got the creature from uh, Jekyll, Jekyll, uh, uh, the creature from Jekyll Island. Have you ever read on uh, again on another side note here, just because I'm looking at the book, uh, sure. Helmut Schmidt's book, Men and Powers? No. Okay, I was just. Have you have you uh, listened to any of the uh, Daryl Cooper's uh, series on Jeffrey Epstein? Yes. So. I kind of got, well, I, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some, cons not really conspiracy stuff, but um, I do want to talk about JFK down the road. But I, I preface this by saying, I'm, I don't really consider myself a conspiracy guy, but I've read the book, uh, The Franklin Cover-Up, um, which I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. But the only reason I believe in that stuff is because I live in Nebraska and I've talked to so many people that had some sort of, a, you know, interaction with that. And that stuff kind of bled into, um, you know, Jeffrey Epstein stuff. And so uh, one of the interesting things with Helmut Schmidt, who is this, you know, German politician, uh, Daryl had quoted this book. So I went and got it and he talks about like bohemian grove and and stuff like that so which you used to be like it if you believe in that stuff back and back then man you you were a conspiracy like a out of your mind conspiracy theorist like you know if you start talking at the dinner table people are going to be like whoa <laughs> but now all of the a lot of that stuff has proven to be true so um yeah what a wild time it would be to be in the know in the 90s huh <laughs> uh yeah and you know i mean I think, you know, one thing that really helped me, honestly, was I was a cab driver for a lot of years. Oh, wow. And I guess probably if I'd just been online, you know, um, dorking around, it would have essentially had the same effect. But yeah, just from talking to so many people, I kind of talk was talked out of and talked myself out of a lot of like former conspiracy stuff that I believed where. Yeah um i've been there <laughs> people you know people i remember just one guy objecting to me that like listen man you know the reason you need all these secret societies to hold your conspiracy together is because otherwise you have to admit that you're talking about all these people planning on giving up all of their power to somebody else yeah. which is not anyone's plan yeah so you gotta go well that's why it's all the bohemian grove because it, it they may have a secret deal that they made there that makes sense if you're exactly, there yeah it yeah but that's not really how it works it's essentially it's exactly what it looks like which is a bunch of corporate and government you know cronies getting yeah. away with murder stealing and killing and causing wars and yeah i guess they say at bohemian grove that it's like you know, Richard Nixon said it was the faggiest thing in the world, but like, well, even does that yeah, necessarily mean that they're blackmailing each other out there, or they're really just giving each other bro jobs and playing tennis. <laughs> you know, 
Yeah, and mm-hmm. even Helmut Schmidt made it kind of sound like in his book when I I had kind of read the section was he just kind of made it sound like they're just drinking and being stupid. So I d- I don't know, but um, you know, we do know that people go there and hang out, and it's weird. But to what extent? Well, as long as we're talking <laughs> about this, I'll say one thing. Yes, hey, there are no owls in the Bible. Yeah, right. right? That owl represents Athena or Minerva. Yeah, Greek okay. mythology that doesn't have anything to do with Lucifer or Satan or Ball or Moloch <laughs> yeah. at all. Yeah, that's a good. Point. It's yeah. an entirely different set of myths. <laughs> there are no owls in the Bible. And there's only yeah. one source in the world that says that that owl is Moloch. It's one person who would dare to open his mouth and say that without looking it up on <laughs> Wikipedia or an encyclopedia for one minute first. Moloch is a bull, not yeah. a damned owl. That's a good so point. <laughs> whatever it is that they're doing there in that silly ceremony, it has nothing to do with Satan. And there's no such thing as Satan anyway. I mean, what is this? You know, yeah, I, that's I think it's completely ridiculous. You know, so, so, uh, yeah, I'll uh, so so I wanted to ask, you know, could you provide a solid book list if if someone like myself who's interested in libertarianism or wants to understand it more, wants to know the the principles of it, you know, if you're a conservative, maybe you've read something like Conscience of a Conservative or something like that. What books would you recommend someone read reads who wants to know more about libertarianism? Well, that's interesting. I mean, one of the first ones would be the Libertarian Manifesto by Murray Rothbard. Okay. That's sort of the be all and end all right there. It's from the late seventies yeah. kind of an era. Um, and by the way, I'm going to put in the show notes here. If if anybody goes to bookbrilliant.com, every single book that we reference will be uh, right there for you to look up. So just wanted to okay, cool. tell that for the reader, but continue. Yeah, sure. So um, well, you're kind of uh, catching me on the spot here. Um, as far as like libertarianism 101, another really great one is one that we published at the Institute a couple of years ago by Sheldon Richman. It's called What Social Animals Owe to Each Other. Okay. And it's a takeoff on, have you ever heard of William Graham Sumner? No, no. He was a writer from what, 120 years ago or whatever. He wrote The Conquest of America by Spain. And it was okay. about how America turned itself into an evil empire, just like Spain, by fighting the war against Spain and becoming it. Huh. Um, really great. But he had written an essay or a book called What Social Classes Owe to Each Other. So Sheldon okay. took that and said, what social animals owe to each other. And this is, you'll hear a libertarian speak of the non-aggression principle. And Sheldon calls it the non-aggression obligation that you know, human beings have an obligation not to aggress on each other. It's not just a, a principle that they should not, but it's a it's an obligation that they must not, you know, okay. shall not. Um, and then it's just a collection of essays, but it's just great to just take you all the way through. You know, libertarianism, I think Murray Rothbard described it as, this is not a quote, but something like, <laughs> it's a combination of, individualist natural rights theory right like thomas jefferson you know hold these truths to be self-evident stuff then is you know austrian school economics and combined with revisionist history and i guess you know maybe he would add or i would add to like a real hatred and contempt for power and corruption and injustice yeah um, you know, that's an essay by Rothbard is, do you hate the state? Um, and and so that really is, you know, kind of the essence where we come from. But then, so you can go way back, right? You could read a lot of Jefferson. There's a, a book by Frederick Bastiat, the French economist called The Law from okay. what, like 1840s, 1850s, something like that, which is a really great primer on libertarian thought. Um, and then... You know, I think you got to specialize from there. Like if you want to get into real anarcho-capitalist stuff, you want to look at um, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe wrote Democracy, the God that Failed. I've heard of that, yeah. <laughs> and and um, in fact, this is the book that Rothbard was denouncing in Do You Hate the State is The Machinery of Freedom by um, David Friedman, who was Milton Friedman's son, who wrote sort of a utilitarian case for how anarcho-capitalism can work. You really don't need to state it all. Uh, Robert Murphy has written a lot about that as well. 
Um, you know, people, especially if you're coming from anyone's coming from the left, or if maybe you have friends and family coming from the left and you want to show them about, you know, why free market capitalism is the solution and not the problem. Yeah. Um, then I would highly recommend Robert Murphy's politically incorrect guides, the uh, to the politically incorrect guide to capitalism and the politically incorrect guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal. And both of those, I mean, especially that politically incorrect guide to capitalism, like if you have a liberal college student, family member or whatever, this is yeah. every, every single objection that they have is in there and covered. And so well, and Bob just does such a great job on that. Um, nice. But of course, you know, the real great is our, our real best guy is Murray Rothbard. He's okay. sort of, you know, our all time leader. So that, and, and he wrote a stack of books. It depends on the topic, right? But he wrote a ton about Austrian economics and he wrote, um, you know, there's a great collection of essays called egalitarianism as a revolt against nature and other essays. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, and oh, oh, of course, Robert Higgs is a great libertarian author um, who wrote uh, Crisis and Leviathan. He coined the concept of the ratchet effect that whenever there's a crisis, government okay. power grows. And then when the crisis ends, the power never goes back to the way it was before. It always stays. So it's just like you're constantly turning a ratchet. And even when the this part, when the handle's going back, the bolt is not turned back, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh and geez, well, looking at my shelf here. Um, oh, you got to read Jim Bovard. I mean, he's more, he covers the news more from a libertarian angle, but he's an all-time great libertarian author. Um, and Ron Paul, you know, Ron Paul, um, his uh, Pillars of Prosperity, um, uh, what's the police state book? I have to break these up. And, uh, oh, Freedom Under Siege. Freedom Under Siege is his police state book. Um, and the Fed. Yep. And now this one was, this is, you know, Ron Paul's notes, but Tom Woods wrote it, but it was really Ron Paul's book that they worked together on. It's called The Revolution Manifesto, which okay. is absolutely fantastic. Um, if uh, you got that right there. Oh. No, I was actually grabbing, um, speaking, just looking over Ron Paul reminded me of this book, uh, The Tyranny of Good Intentions. Have you read, have you read this one? Uh, no, that sounds familiar. It's by Paul Craig Roberts and Lawrence uh, Stratton. Oh, uh, yeah, Paul Craig Roberts. He, yeah, and I think that's from back before he was probably more of a nut. Um, oh, Ron Paul also wrote Liberty Defined. Yeah, okay, um, yeah. Which is really good. It's it's A to Z, um, Libertarian Topics. Yeah. Uh, is another great one there. I pulled um, up his uh, Amazon. He's got, yeah, Freedom Under Siege and a foreign pol and then another book, a Foreign Policy of Freedom. Yeah, which is a collection of speeches that he gave over like 30 years or 25 years. It's absolutely fantastic. Yes. Um, and then, you know, I got to admit that I am, you know, much more of a foreign policy guy than I am like a libertarian theory guy or an economist. Well, that's so, all right, because that rolls into the next question, which is okay. uh, what are some of the best anti-war books or, or books that would make us think differently about war? Of course, there is War is a Racket. You know, that's probably a good starting point for anybody, right? Sure. Well, you know, I wrote a couple. Of course, um, <laughs> which are available. Uh, I've got the links to those uh, in the show notes. Yes. So, look, I mean, Enough Already was written you know, I guess I should, I'll tell you that, you know, Fool's Aaron is the book about Afghanistan. When it started out, it was supposed to be sort of the entire terror war for dummies. Mm -hmm. And then I just got carried away on Afghanistan. I couldn't wrap it up. <laughs> so chapter two became a whole book. I see. And I went <laughs> I see. back and I wrote, I started over again. And this time I kept chapter two to chapter length and then went on from there. And so, um, you know, it's not that I made a whole lot of money off of it or anything. I sold a few thousand, um, quite a few thousand, I guess. Nice. <laughs> but but the important part is that um, it got a real word of mouth behind it. Yeah. And um, and I think the real the reason why is because I think you know people are so used to the idea if they're going to read an anti-war book. It's going to be by Noam Chomsky, who they know is some kind of leftist, communist, anarcho-syndicalist type who they just yeah. can't, you know, these college types, these woolly-headed intellectuals with their, you know, 
And like once you're that far to the left, then that means that you don't believe in the American system at all, right? Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. Kind of thing. And and so it just is it essentially is kind of disinviting half the population or more from being welcome to take a look at it. You know what I mean? In a yeah, way. of course. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. That's to pause for one second. That's kind of why um, I like to read military history and stuff, but same thing, like the idea of anti-war that you're the first image in your mind is some, you know, hippie with a guitar and the peace sign yeah. and who just, who doesn't even understand, uh, you know, the the what you know they're, they're the guys who are spitting on the soldiers or whatever and it's like yeah well i don't want to be associated with those guys but exactly. as i started to learn it in really the last couple of years um because i was like i was in second grade on 9 11 and i remember all of that stuff and i remember being like so pro-war as a kid and like we are the good guys and we're kicking the bad guys ass and this is awesome and then as i've started to you know growing up and talking to veterans who were the first people to kind of make me second guess it because they were second guessing mm -hmm. a lot of stuff and then as i've read these books and um <laughs> started to, to now i'm at the point where you know I, I would say there's probably a lot of americans who don't even know, know the difference between the afghanistan and the iraq war you know they, they probably think it's one and the same and um when i'm looking at it i'm still trying to sort you know what the hell was going on there it seems like a lot of uh corruption and missteps but but yeah so uh, again well, with your I'm, point I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm just like you but older right so i'm when i was a kid you know i was influenced by all kinds of things you know who knows yeah but uh, one of the things that always stuck with me was the only veterans that I talked to, like, you know, my, my dad and my friend's dad didn't go to Vietnam. Like my dad almost got drafted, but they didn't take him. And then yeah, they never called him again. Um, but he was at right age for that. Um, but whenever I did come across a Vietnam veteran, or really any veteran that I ever came across around that time, pretty much uh, there's like one old guy from world war two that I knew down the street, but otherwise they were all who was proud of his service. But otherwise any veteran that I met was a Vietnam veteran. Yes. And they were all very broken men and very unhappy. And they were, you know, all, whenever there's a bum on the side of the road in that era in the 1980s or whatever, standing with a sign, they're all wearing their camouflage green old flag jacket. Yeah. Right. And they're from Vietnam They're, You know, that was what was wrong with them was they'd been to Vietnam and back. And if I ever talked to one, say, you know, a friend's uncle, Bob or whatever, who'd been there, whatever, yeah. everything they have to say is like, let me tell you the truth about the army. Boy. <laughs> yeah. Really yeah. Hate it. They yeah. They hate the army. They hate it. And they, and they want you to know that they do and that you should never trust them. You should never believe in them. They say they're family. They won't take care of you. They hate you. You know, one of the first guys who, um, yeah, like one of my first pot dealers when I was like in, in, in like 10th grade was a uh, agent orange victim who, Ooh. Um, he actually was one of the, at that time, he was the only guy in town probably who was allowed to have pot. He wasn't allowed to sell it. He was allowed to have <laughs> it. The government would sell it, would send him a tin full yeah. of rolled joints. Um, that was that from weed that was grown on a government farm in Kentucky or something that only agent orange patients were allowed to have. Wow. I didn't know um, that. <laughs> and I'm sure he died young too. Like he was sick as hell from that. Um, so just that was all my real life experience long before I was ever old enough to have to choose whether I was going to join the army or not or whatever. I was inculcated from a young age on the alternative revisionist theory of what's really going on around here. Right. While I was still just a kid. Yeah. So, like you're saying, I don't know if you're if it was young enough uh, for you, but like you're talking about these veterans are coming back and yeah. they don't believe in it. Well, what the hell? They were there and back and they're not the first one in line telling me how that I should be cheering. Well, something obviously is terribly wrong here, you know, just right yeah. off the bat. Even if you're a kid, you know that that's not right. Yeah. And, you know, I'll never forget a friend of mine went off to a rock war two and I talked to him right before he went. And he said, let me tell you something. George Bush really cares about us and he's doing a lot of good things for the military right now. And that was the last time I ever spoke to him. Um, and uh, I, I don't think he died in the war or whatever. He's fine. But um, 
But I just remember thinking, man, it's so unfortunate how caught up people get in believing in that because George Bush don't give a damn about you, dude. You're not even the help. You know, like his butler is five levels of social class above you, dude. He doesn't give a damn about you. And yeah. and anyway, so. Well, you know what, though, is what makes it, Vietnam, when I think about it, um, and I just read, um, what is it called, like the Killing Field or the Killing Zone or whatever, um, Vietnam book. And look, from a military tactical battle perspective, th those books are super interesting. And I feel for their, for those soldiers. I mean, they were there to fight or whatever. But when you look at it at a higher level, it does piss me off because um, my the first time that my mom ever really experienced death was when her uncle went to Vietnam as a paramedic. Um, he was a corpsman and he got wiped out in a raid because the Viet Cong had killed some uh, Marines in the Battle of Kassan. And uh, my my, uh, my great uncle, Winston Parker, was in this uh, Marine group and they went in there and they basically all got killed. And um, I, you know, growing up, I was always told that he got shot in the head and it was a quick and painless death. Well, then when you read books like um, We Were Soldiers Once and Men and you're reading about how these 17 year old kids who are 18 year old kids who just graduate high school and they go to Vietnam and they're getting wounded on this battlefield. And at night, the other American soldiers are hearing these other Americans who are wounded and they can't get to them and they're being bayoneted and hacked to death in the night and they're hearing them scream. You know, and it's like, I don't know if that's if my own, if my great uncle did die a quick and, and painless death. Luckily, my mom will never hear this episode. She, she doesn't have to hear this, but I don't know if that's true or if that's just something they said to, you know, make my great grandma uh, okay with it. And then I also think about these, these, you know, he, he wanted to, after he got out of the military, he wanted to be a doctor and help people. And I think about these kids that, that went to Vietnam and it's like, what was their life? They had a great upbringing, you know, or whatever, uh, hopefully, um, you know, the, in the sixties, they went to high school and they graduated and then they got uh, shot in the gut in Vietnam and hacked to death in the middle of the night by people they couldn't even see because it was so dark. And that was their life. And when I really sit and think about that, it's, it really pisses me off uh, when you start to look over about it, what was that war necessary and what did we get out of it, you know? Yeah, seriously. Well, and look, and this is the same thing. That, well, and look back to, so sort of the tangent was on, you know, how I wrote this book, but the point was about how nobody wants to hear this stuff from some stinking hippie. Yeah. You know, there's this movie uh, born on the 4th of July yeah. where <laughs> yeah. Tom Cruise, he's, um, I'm sorry, I forget the guy's name. He's a real guy. Um, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Ron. See if I can find it. Ron something. Um, and the it. thing is, so that story is a true story that he went there, he got shot in the spine, he came home all wrecked. And then what? He moved left. He grew out his hair, he started smoking dope, and he became yeah. uh, some kind of leftist surrounded by hippies. And, you know, grow your beer out, grow your hair out and go and all the thing. And so, but the point being like, you know, he might as well have been drinking Bud Light and taking puberty blockers and waving his rainbow flag and going, oh, we surrender to the VC. Yeah. Look, the country belonged to the VC. The, v the VC means South Vietnamese guerrillas. In other words, if the Vietnamese invaded your town, you would be a guerrilla killing them. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The VC were. We were the invaders, not them. Yeah. You know, um, but um, the thing of it was that it it was this massive kind of own goal, right? It was they just these anti-war veterans shooting themselves in the foot by moving left at all. When that was exactly what the people back home who still believed in their government and believed in the war didn't need to hear. What they needed to hear was, hey, I'm still a right winger. I'm still a Republican. I still support X, Y, and Z conservative positions, of course. Yes. All I'm saying is this war in Vietnam ain't working out for these reasons, right? Yes. That kind of thing. And so the fact of the summer of love and day glow bubble letters and LSD and Janet Joplin's gigantic sunglasses and whatever, all of that stuff is like this horrible taint on the anti-war movement that has nothing to do with the anti-war movement. And you can say the same thing about pot, like on the Simpsons, uh, this is an old reference for you, I guess, but 
on the Simpsons, if anybody says the word weed in any context, all of a sudden they start singing, come on, ride on the peace train. Yeah. Blah, blah. And now all of a sudden it's 67 hippie folk music. But yeah, like, come yeah. on, man, there's a lot of pot culture since 1967. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot. You, you could put Willie Nelson. You could put Cypress Hill. You could put whoever up there smoking dope and not have it necessarily be about 1960s hippies. Yeah. But we're, it's just stuck that way. They'll never not do it that way. And it's the same kind of thing with the anti-war thing. Now, yeah. here's my thing. I'm not really right winger. As I said, I'm a libertarian. I'm not a leftist either. But yeah. uh, but I and, and I didn't write my book. Uh, it's enough already. If anybody's interested in the book, it's about the terror war from Jimmy Carter all the way through Trump, all the Middle East wars, all the way through. And I didn't write it to suck up to right wingers or to suck up to soldiers. I don't pander to anybody in the book. It's just me talking is all it is. Yeah. But what I don't do is talk like a leftist. What I don't do is say, oh, man, we need that money for public schools. Well, yeah. I don't believe in that. Right. Yeah. I don't, and whatever kind of left wing shibboleths about democracy and this and that kind of thing that you would be repelled by. Yeah, or like, yeah. Oh, see, it's just the corruption of capitalism. You can't read a left wing anti-war book that does, doesn't lump in the entire world empire with having a capitalist system at all. Yeah. Well, you know what? Those aren't one and the same thing, if you ask me. Um, yeah. So you ought to be able to read my book and understand that, like, look, I'm a Texan. I'm an American. I'm a libertarian. I believe in free markets and no taxes. Right. And so um, yeah. <laughs> you can't outflank me on that stuff. Yeah. But I'm just telling you like this stuff this is all wrong. Yeah. The basic. I, and I can run through it real quick. And, and the reason that people like the book, I think is because I tell you a bunch of stuff that's true that you don't know a lot of it, but None of it's like, ooh, super top secret operation, this and that, that you have to like believe me, right? Exactly. It's all very checkable, you know, narrative. Yes. And at the same time, you should know a lot of it. You should know enough that when you read my book, you know that it's true. You know that this is right. You know, yeah. I always wondered why they made that decision. Ah, now I understand. And so that's all I'm doing. I'm taking your puzzle piece of your imagination of the last 40 years of American Middle East policy. And I'm going, look, man, here's what happened. And here's why. And so then what the reason the book has done so well is because when people read it, they go, I got to give this to my dad. I got to give this to my uncle, Bob. I got to yeah. give this to my right wing brother-in-law because I know that they're going to be one over. And I get that. In fact, a guy just told me on Twitter last week, he read the book, then he made his whole family read the book and it changed all their lives forever. And that's it. Yeah. And so people go from, you know, lifelong Reaganite, lifelong, you know, George W. Bush supporter, lifelong, you know, civilizational war against Islam. And then they read my book and they go, oh, that was a bunch of crap. <laughs> yeah. And but I make it easy for you because I'm not asking you to move left to paraphrase Obama. If you like your identity, you can keep it. OK, yeah. I'm just telling you that this stuff is bullshit, dude. That's all it is. You know, yeah. and, and frankly, so here's the deal. And people do already know this. OK, Jimmy Carter backed the Mujahideen in Afghanistan fighting yeah. against the Soviets. And he backed Saddam Hussein fighting against the Iranians after the Iranian revolution. Saddam did a coup. The Iranians did a revolution. America supported Saddam against Iran. Ronald Reagan came in. He continued both of those policies all the way through. Right. Then. H.W. Bush comes in. It's the end of the Cold War. The Afghan war ends. The Iran-Iraq war ends. But then in a dispute over war debts and overproduced uh, oil from shared wells, Saddam invades Kuwait. Blowback from the Iran-Iraq war where America yeah. supported him. Yeah. And, and Iran too, but especially Saddam. Yeah. So then America launches Iraq War One in order to uh, drive Iraq out of Kuwait and guarantee the safety of Saudi Arabia, which wasn't really in danger anyway, but they said that. And they launched that war. Now, at the end of that war, you might remember, a lot of people maybe have heard of this, but you don't know a lot about it. There was the failed uprising against Saddam Hussein. Yeah. Bush Sr. urged the Kurds in the North and the Shiites in the South to rise up and overthrow Saddam 
But then he changed his mind and he let Saddam keep his tanks and helicopters and crush the rebellion, killed 100,000 people. If you've ever seen the movie Three Kings with Ice Cube and Marky Mark and George Clooney, it's a gold heist. Yeah. And the setting, though, is it's that the aftermath of Iraq War One and the Americans rule the South and the Shiites are rising up against Saddam, but Saddam's killing them all. And then by the end of the movie, they're all fleeing into Iran. OK, yeah. well, what happened there was the Iran, the Iraqis who had chosen Iran's side in the Iran Iraq War and who had lived in Iran for 10 years, they now came across the border to lead the revolution. And so the Bush senior administration realized, even though they had just spent eight years backing Saddam Hussein to contain the Iranian Shiite revolution, they were now importing it into Iraq and they were about to give them Baghdad. So they panicked and let Saddam crush them instead. Then this became their excuse to stay in Saudi Arabia. We have to keep our bases in Saudi in order to fly the no-fly zones over the north and south of Iraq in order to protect the Shiites and the Kurds, right? Not that Saddam was going to keep killing them till they were all dead. The insurrection was over, but that was the excuse. And to wage the blockade. And it was keeping those bases in Saudi that turned the Mujahideen that America had supported in Afghanistan, which had included not just the Afghans, but had included what was called the Arab Afghan army of Arabs from all over the Middle East who had gone to fight in the 80s in Afghanistan, which included bin Laden and Zawahiri and the leaders of what became Al-Qaeda. This is what turned them against the United States. And then even though they started attacking the United States in 1990, Uh, They killed a rabbi in New York in 1990. They tried to blow up the World Trade Center. They almost succeeded in toppling one tower into the other in 1993 when Bill Clinton had only been in power for a month and a week, right? And then the only reason nobody paid attention and they just kind of faded away was because two days later, the ATF raided the Branch Davidians. And so the whole Waco siege completely distracted from from people's just imagination that, look, man, what does it mean they set up a truck bomb in the basement they were trying to topple one tower into the other they could have killed thirty thousand people or more right yeah. it's four o'clock in the afternoon they could have taken that seriously right then it all got swept under the rug and then they kept attacking us all through the 1990s and bill clinton supported them anyway he supported them in bosnia he supported him in chechnya he supported them in kosovo and in fact the ringleader of the 9-11 plot Khalid sheikh mohammed And the two guys who are the most scandalous now, the San Diego cell, the Flight 77 pilots. Yeah. Who the CIA had followed it to the United States a year and a half before the attack and had failed to alert the FBI to wrap them up after an apparent failed sting operation to try to or a failed attempt to recruit them as double agents, seemingly. Um, Those guys, too, had fought in Bosnia on Bill Clinton's side. That was where they earned their stripes as bin Ladenite Mujahideen. Yeah, yes. The Pentagon on September 11th. So, um, was, w- real quick though, too, wasn't uh, the uh, what we'd call Black Hawk Down uh, Mogadishu? Wasn't that what kind of? And you can tell uh-huh. me if I'm totally wrong on this, but I have read that that's kind of what had emboldened Osama bin Laden because he he like you said earned the stripes kind of down there. He had influenced them or consulted with them in some sort, and he thought, well, they didn't do anything about. Uh, what happened? No, that's in funny. Mogadishu. So uh, let's go ahead with 9/11. Is any yeah. of that? True? Well, no, that's that's totally wrong, but only half wrong. So here's <laughs> what it is. He said that, but he was just jerking your chain. What really happened was, and he had told this to Abdel Bari Atwan, was that it was his men who had been involved in Black Hawk Down, who was yeah. you know Bin Ladenites loyal to him, who had been dispatched by him to go and fight the Americans there. Um. And he said he was so disappointed that Bill Clinton pulled all the troops out. He wanted a war of attrition. He wanted to replicate what America had just helped him and his buddies do to the Soviets in Afghanistan, bog them down, bleed them to bankruptcy, force them out the long way and the hard way in a way that really, I don't think there's any question, helped to break the Soviet Union. And and of course, you know, the Reaganites took credit for that, that ha ha, see our support for the Mujahideen Afghanistan helped break the Soviet Union. Well, that's what bin Laden thought too. And he thought, well, so I want to replicate and do this same thing to you. So um, all that happened there is you just got, you just jumped ahead in my story. What's the motive of all of this is 
the basis in Saudi Arabia and support for dictatorships in the region. And that includes support for Israel over the Palestinians and the Lebanese as well. But then what's the strategy? The strategy is to provoke, was to provoke the United States into overreacting and getting bogged down like the Soviets in Afghanistan. And so uh, he told Abdel Bari Atwan in 1997, that he was so disappointed that the Americans left in Somalia. He wanted to replicate that and destroy us the long way in a war of attrition, he said. Right. So this is why they kept attacking us. And they did the Kobar Towers attack in 1996, where they killed 19 American airmen stationed in Saudi for bombing Iraq with. And then what did Bill Clinton do? He blamed it on Iran. An Iranian-backed Shiite Saudi Hezbollah. What a bunch of crap. And in doing so, then let bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed get away with it. And that yeah. was what the, how the Saudis wanted to spin it at the time. And yeah. then um, was, of course, the embassy attacks in 98 in uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, Nairobi, Kenya, and then the USS Cole in the year 2000, right? And Bill Clinton, at the time that they're bombing the coal, Bill Clinton's still backing them in Chechnya, or maybe he's wrapping that up, yeah. um, you know, at the end of his presidency there. Um, and so he's, one, he's provoked this attack against us, uh, or these attacks against us. And not only is he not doing anything to stop them, he's actually continuing to take advantage of these groups and figure that he can win them over. And I show in both of my books, uh, Fool's Aaron and Enough Already, can read the quotes where Bill Clinton and two of his Democratic congressman allies, Brad Sherman, uh, who's still there, I think, and Tom Lantos, all three of them said something very close to, how could those Muslims attack us like this after everything that we've done for them lately? You know, they, they had convinced themselves that somehow they had bought the loyalty of these Mujahideen, even though they had declared war in the United States. And they had said over and over again what their reasons were. And uh, again, it was the uh, blockade and the bombing of Iraq and the support for Israel, support for the kings and sultans and emirs yeah. and potentates of the region. So it's super. I, I, it's very impressive how how you are able to. You have all the these dates and names and locations um, that you're able to put all that together. And so I, I think that's what's nice, as you said in your book, is you don't have you know secret documents that only I've seen that you have to trust me. It's like, hey, you can go back and Google the headlines if you really want to, you know, uh, so it apart. So, you know, I've kind of started to to realize uh, moving onward, but I, I think it's kind of parallel with this is. Uh, all of the the craziness that the CIA has been doing in, in the world, and so I got a couple uh, books on that. I was gonna, you know, mention them to you, see what your thoughts were, and then if you have any other books, uh, people could read to understand the CIA better and maybe understand their meddling in other countries and how that has also, you know, led to some of this stuff. So I've got, uh, you know, the Looming Tower. Uh, pretty, they, they made that TV show about it or whatever by Lawrence Wright, and then of co, of course. Uh, uh, Ghost Wars um, by by Steve Cole. Um, have you read either of those or do you have other books that you would maybe recommend or, or maybe you don't recommend those? You tell me. I do recommend both of those. And in fact, you know, in Lawrence Wright's book there, he talks about how the lead hijacker, Mohammed Atta and his buddy Ramsey bin al -Sheib, they were engineering students, Egyptian engineering students in Germany. And when Israel invaded Lebanon, in 1996 in Operation Grapes of Wrath. Yeah. As soon as that happened, these two essentially filled out their last will and testament, which was like symbolically joining the army um, in the fight against the United States, who they blamed for what Israel was doing in Lebanon. And then a couple of months later, bin Laden's first declaration of war came out. Uh -huh. And in there, he talked all about the Operation Grapes of Wrath and what's now known as the first Kana massacre, because the Israelis did it again 10 years later. Um, yeah. The first Kana massacre of 1996, where 106 women and children were killed in a UN shelter. Mm -hmm. And bin Laden said, oh, we'll never forget the pictures of the children's arms and legs severed from their bodies and this and that. So this is when the lead hijacker traveled to Afghanistan to join Al Qaeda. And there's video of him with bin Laden in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, from 1997, the next year. So 
Um, that's a, a very important part of the story, which I think yeah. Lawrence, right. He mentions it, but he doesn't seem to make that big of a deal about it. He'll, he'll tell you that like, yeah, these guys sure are religious extremists. And then he explains the whole time how extreme their politics are yeah. and how their extreme politics are driven by America's stre- extreme politics. Now this has to do with some big, you know, jujitsu match in the sky between Jesus and Mohammed. <laughs> This is all about who's backing who's dictator and pumping whose oil at artificially low prices and who is severing arms and legs from babies' bodies. You know, yeah. you don't need a holy book to tell you to take revenge against people who blow up your kin. And honestly, especially for people old enough to really remember, you know, I know you said you were a kid then, but for people who were old enough to really remember how angry you were on September 11th and how bad you wanted to see uncle Sam go over there and blow some dudes apart in revenge and see how they like it. Well, that's exactly how they felt for what Bill Clinton had been doing to them. It's the same thing. It's not different. And of course they just hide behind all this religious stuff. I mean, man, I remember, (laughs) I remember, you know, it's a big talk radio head and uh, I still am. And I'm driving down the road and I'm listening to talk radio and this guy's saying our government is not being honest with us about the true motive for this attack. They're just not being honest. And they're saying that they hate us for our freedom. Well, that's just not the whole truth, man. There's so much more going on. And if we don't tell the honest truth about what's behind this attack, then we're never going to get the right answer. And I'm like, all right, all right, this is great. And he goes, it's Satan. <laughs> Satan controls the Muslims and it's the war against the Jews and the Christians and we have to defend the poor Israelis. Yes. You know, it's just, you know, like, come on, you don't remember Bill Clinton killing all those people. It was just last year. You know what I mean? Two years yeah, ago. There was a lot of like terror porn, I'll call it, uh, that that Christians had had put out there about, you know, islam and their their radical like that they were going to come into america from the inside out and and all this stuff and that it was all just that like this this religious thing and that they basically hated us because we live you know opposite to them that they're going to come over here and like force this conversion you know there's so many books and let me ask you who used to talk about that yeah let me ask it ain't it funny how they just dropped that yeah no kidding no kidding as, as soon as the democrats decided that no the story now is trump and russia yeah yeah Exactly. And then came COVID and then Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of it. And you would think that on the right, that the right would say, no, it's not Russia. It's Islam. But they don't. They go, no, it's China. Yeah. What about Islam? I thought these people, religion, turn them into automatons who wake up every morning wanting to do nothing but kill Christians for living in the West and being innocent. And yeah, love yeah. your mamas. That that's over now. Exactly. It's because it was always a lie. And how yeah, I think about that a lot. We're ended with Obama backing Al Qaeda in Libya, Syria, and Yemen. Yeah, Trump too. So we'll talk about the the terror war kind of petering out and ending on a down note. Yeah. You know, Al Qaeda's forces, our side in Yemen, just lost. How sad. It it reminds me of, uh, you know, talking about what was really behind 9-11 and stuff and them not being straightforward about it. It was just like Benghazi. Uh, I've met Chris Pronto. Um, He was one of the guys on the, you know, the book and the movie 13 Hours. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he was one of the guys there and it was the same thing. And that's the whole famous Hillary Clinton. What difference does it matter if it was a cartoon? And, you know, oh, well, the reason why Benghazi happened is, uh, you know, what do they say? Because a cartoon or a YouTube video made him mad. And they're like, Oh, that that's actually why those guys, why all these guys stormed this building. And, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, we believe that one. Yeah. And look at what happened there. And you know what? This really goes to the corruption of the Republicans, too, because they found this word that like has this ring to it, Benghazi. Right. Yeah. And they made the biggest deal about it in the world of what had yeah. happened to these guys. And I would say that all of their points were right. Yeah. So they said that. These guys were stranded out in the middle of nowhere. They should have been in Tripoli, not in Benghazi, right? Um, They uh, didn't have enough force protection. They didn't have enough security. They had asked for improvements in security and didn't get it. And then when the 
diplomats came under attack, the CIA was too slow in coming to their rescue, and the military was too slow in coming to their rescue, right? Okay, fine. Whatever, dude. That totally misses the point. The question is, what the hell were they doing there? Yes. What they were doing was they were committing high treason. They were arming Al-Qaeda. Yeah. And then shipping them off to fight in Syria. Why did Christopher Stevens get killed? Because Hillary Clinton had stationed him in the middle of a hornet's nest. Again, well, how could these Muslims attack us after everything we've been doing for them lately? Well, we fought a whole war for them. We killed Gaddafi for them. Yeah. yeah. And now we're arming them and we're shipping them off to fight in Syria. So they won't touch us. They love us. We have a force field of alliance now with the Bin Ladenites again, even though this is in the spring of 11. Uh, pardon me. No, no, this is in the in the fall of 2012. We only had just gotten our troops out of Iraq six months before. Or, you know, no, I guess a few more than that. But here's the important point. Barack Obama was still waging a drone war against yes. Al-Qaeda yeah. in Yemen and in Pakistan in 2012. Yeah. And in July of 2012, he killed a Pakistan, pardon me, a Libyan Al-Qaeda terrorist in Pakistan named Sheikh Yahya Alibi. And Sheikh Yahya Alibi was the brother of Sheikh Ibn Alibi, who you might remember Dick Cheney had tortured into implicating Saddam Hussein in teaching Al-Qaeda how to make chemical weapons. Small world. Anyway, (laughs) so Barack Obama uh, murders the guy that Dick Cheney tortured's brother with a drone while... Barack Obama has Christopher Stevens and all these guys embedded in the middle of an Al-Qaeda base. Yeah. So then I'm an Al-Zawahiri, the leader of Al-Qaeda, put out a podcast where he said, hey, listen, the uh, anniversary of September 11th is coming up. And, you know, what would be funny would be if you guys would be uh, would avenge the death of Sheikh Yahya Alibi here in Pakistan by getting the Americans who got them, who for some stupid reason have stationed themselves right in the middle of Benghazi, which is, you know, is in the east and Derna and, and, and other yeah, places. I kind of forgot it. I hated guys. Came yeah, from. dude, I that forgot what about happened that. On September yeah. 12th is they were obeying uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri. I forgot and about she says, that. What difference does it make? Well, the difference it makes is whether, gee, uh, accidental ember blew onto the roof. And, and, you know, somebody was killed for no reason or whether these guys were up to their eyeballs in Mujahideen as though the first World Trade Center bombing and every attack by Al Qaeda since then had never happened. And yeah. we were right back in the 1980s where we just loved these guys. Never mind that 4,500 of our guys just got killed fighting the Sunni insurgency. Well, I should say 4,000 out of 4,500 got killed fighting the Sunni-based insurgency in Iraq that was led by Al-Qaeda in Iraq as recently as a year ago in 2012. And, you know, it just goes, it's a perfect limited hangout, right? Because who, who championed that war other than Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton? Well, Lindsey Graham and John McCain champion that war. The leaders of the Republican Party champion that war. They said Barack Obama wasn't doing enough to get rid of Gaddafi on behalf of these terrorists. So then when Trey Gowdy and all these guys come and they want to do a Benghazi scandal, all they can do is say, yeah, there should have been better security there. Instead of pointing out that you guys should all be in prison for life, for treason. Yeah, like you said, Trump limited hangout. Hero. Yeah, a limited hangout. Exactly, exactly as you said. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We, I guess we should have put up a higher fence or, you know, and it's like, no, you shouldn't have been doing the other stuff you were doing. Seriously. Uh, I want to bring up um I want to on the topic of the CIA and I want to hop right back into some some war stuff but while we're here um I had mentioned earlier that I don't really consider myself to be a conspiracy theory guy and when I say that I mean I actually believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone when he shot JFK but I will say that belief is starting to get shaken up by some of the the CIA documents or whatever, which I haven't really looked into them. But from the buzz that I've kind of heard is starting to make me second guess some things. Now, why I kind of had believed that was because of this book right here. Case closed. I'm sure you're probably familiar with it. I'm wondering if you have. Posner. Been- 
Uh, yeah, yeah, by Gerald Posner. I'm wondering oh, yeah, that if guy's you, a fucking hack. Really? So every book, every book about JFK always has its has its own compelling evidence, up to and including like the guy who was uh, he was the bad guy in one of the Supermans with um, uh, back in the day. He he wrote a book where let's see if I can find it real quick. I met him, but he wrote a book on um, how his dad was connected to some mob guys uh, that that knew or th- that had killed JFK. And everybody, every book, like I said, that you read will have some sort of a a, a compelling evidence about it. So I'm mm-hmm. wondering um, if you have anything uh you know any books that you would recommend and i'm talking about by the way jack o'halloran he was the bad guy in super one of the bad guys in superman 2 uh he wrote a book where he talks about how his dad was connected to the guys that killed kennedy or whatever Uh, the point of it is is just like people get out there with it so what what would you recommend that i look up to change my mind that that lee harvey oswald acted alone well, um, I'm not a big JFK guy, and I decided in high school that I'm not reading those JFK books. Makes you know, sense. Makes Jack Peck sense. In the movie Slacker, he runs into this JFK theorist guy. Um, yeah. And there's this stack of JFK conspiracy books this high, and I just decided then that I don't give a damn. Yeah, um, and I think that that's honestly, I mean, what are we going to do? You know, it's a good point. I mean, if w- whatever, if, if look, I spend I think, my life reading about it, what am I going to do? <laughs> it, look, I think it's also, to me, it's probably unprovable unless you're going to be the expert on this, like the very best guy, and then you're going to line up your very best proof on it. But, uh, you know, short of that, nobody's ever going to really have a solid case. Yeah. I just always assume ever. I mean, I saw the movie uh, JFK when I was 14. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't know who Alan Dulles and all those guys were then, but um, I think it's a safe assumption that the CIA did it. I think <laughs> that I don't, and I don't think that that means that Jack Kennedy was Ron Paul or something either, that he was so great. Um, yeah. You don't have to be so great for one gangster to kill another gangster. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? In fact, he had just authorized a coup d'etat against his own sock puppet dictator of South Vietnam, you know, DM, three weeks before he was killed. Yeah, so, that all through that him. All right. Yeah. Um, um, however, you know, the fact that they put the guy that he had been the CIA director that he fired on the commission to investigate his murder is that's almost all you need to know right there. And then, you know, the recent documents that came out say that a guy named, uh, Joanna Nides, I don't know how to pronounce these Greek last names, but it's spelled like, uh, Joanna Nides, Janides, Janides, something like that. Right. Um, he was the CIA agent, not just an asset. He was a CIA officer, and he ran the Fair Play for Cuba committee that Oswald worked for. Yeah. We know that Oswald was CIA when he was a defector to the Soviet Union, that that was essentially fake, right? Yes. He went there and right. then defected and came back. That Yeah. You know, um, Which... Yeah, so, that seems like a, it seems like why would they let him come back? That's and look, what a phrase. He goes, look, I didn't kill anybody. I'm a patsy. Well, like, you know yeah. what? What a believable statement. Yeah. You know I mean? Like, he didn't just say, you got the wrong guy. Yeah. I, I was just sitting there. I don't know. You, you must have been another guy in a white T-shirt. I don't know. Instead, he goes, I'm the patsy. In other words, he knows that he was set up. Wow. Be the guy to take the fall for the thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, now, as far as like who shot from which direction and all that, I'm not the expert in that. I, I will tell you that there's a sequel now to um, JFK that you can get it on the Pirate Bay. It's called Through the Looking Glass. JFK Through the Looking Glass. It's a documentary by Oliver Stone. Okay. And he talks about how after the movie came out in what, 94? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, no, I was like 15, so maybe like 91. I'll look it up. Um, Yeah, I think it was like 91. So anyway, after that came out, they passed a law where they released a lot of the records to some university near Washington, I forget, in Virginia somewhere, in Maryland somewhere. Yeah. And he says, well, ever since then, 30 years ago, a ton of researchers have been digging through all of that material and look at all the stuff they've found. And he really goes through a whole lot of stuff that I think is pretty compelling. But I think the most compelling thing is that they faked the autopsy, that 
you know, and, and I'm not an expert in ballistics and this and that, but the idea being that he was shot in the front of the head. There was a giant exit wound in the back of his head. Now, there are plenty of pictures of that and plenty of witnesses to that. And then they just faked it and they put his head back together again, you know, as uh, as morticians do and 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 made the hair look good. And then they took a bunch of pictures of that, of the back of his head being intact. And there was just a total, like, obviously transparent frame up job. They got away with it in the in the moment but they got completely caught afterwards uh doing that and so then the implication being that he was shot from over there not from back there yeah. um, now i've showed this apruder film to some soldiers i know who've been to war and back and asked them like you see what happens to his forehead here is that an entrance wound or an exit wound because I mean, that looks like an exit wound to me but i don't know anything and yeah. then i've been told by multiple soldiers who've been to war and back that i can't tell you that could be an entrance wound. It could be an exit wound. It's just yeah. too difficult to tell in the way that that that's happening. So, but look, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things he talks about in there is something that I knew from the time I was a kid that, you know, my dad is, is no conspiracy theorist, but one of the first things that he taught me about this, they just all knew that this was true from the very beginning was that there were people who saw Lee Harvey Oswald calmly eating a sandwich in the break room three minutes after the shooting. And there's just yeah. no way he took apart his rifle and hit it and ran, you know, leaped down six flights of stairs and then got out his apple and his sandwich and framed it up like he was just chilling. It just didn't happen. And, and you know, Oliver Stone says he has um, these two women were in the stairwell and they said he would had to jump right over us to get there. It just didn't not happen. So, in other words, his handler told him, be there. And then he was there and then they got him, you know, yeah. and they set his ass up is sure what it looks like. Um, yeah. As far as all the details, you know, I don't know. I, I, I do think it's important, even though this part is completely fictional, I think there's a, a very important lesson in the movie JFK. Um, the uh, Donald Sutherland, who's playing the character of Fletcher Prouty, Mr. Yeah. X, they're sitting on the park bench and Mr. X says to Jim Garrison, he says, what is all this? Anyway, like, you know, there's, there's, they've got the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument and all these white marble statues of national power around yeah. them. He says, what is all this for anyway? So the central organizing principle in any society is the war power, Mr. Garrison. That's what this is about. And if this guy's not using the war power the way that others want it to be used, then yeah, they'll kill him and move him out of the way. And then... You know, they show like what he surmises, a smoky room full of a bunch of generals and spies and Lyndon Johnson telling them, you get me that seat and I'll get you your war. And, you know, whether that's exactly how it happened or not. Yeah, I'm not convinced that Kennedy was even going to pull out of Vietnam. Uh, you know, my friend Mike Swanson's book, The War State, I think makes the most compelling case that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, that Jack Kennedy really wanted to end the Cold War and really meant to. But, you know, people make so much of that um, American University speech. He does say a lot of stuff in there. It's honestly, though, at the end, I think he was really that the whole purpose of that speech was just trying to push through the test ban treaty. I don't think that that was all about like, come on, let's completely end the cold war with the Soviet union. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, I don't know. I, I, I could see how right wingers at that time inside the national security state would have just convinced themselves that this guy's just soft on the reds and he's getting in our way and his budgets are too small. And I see. Yeah. So, uh, his moving on yeah so uh and i appreciate um everything you said there because i think that that all makes sense now uh again shifting gears kind of going a little bit back to what we were talking to when you were on that uh episode of the unraveling with, with jocko and daryl you had mentioned a book called yesterday's man about mm -hmm. um our uh, our president right now joe biden and so i went and i got that book and you said a quote in that podcast and i think about it all the time you said and just even the way you said it you said i can't believe joe biden is the president right now and i think that so much i can't believe joe biden is the president right now and so um I say that about them all matt <laughs> so you know um i'll say I, I, I'm open to go anywhere with this, but one thing, you know, I want to talk about, uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine and, and all that. And when, when that had kind of started off and that popped off, 
I went and I got, uh, I went to my library and I rented the books, Russia Without Putin by Tony Wood, and then Putin is Downfall and Russia's Coming uh, Crash by uh, Richard Laurie. And in those books, um, what was interesting was I learned about Alexander Dugan. And from the books that, that I read, it really seemed like Alexander Dugan um, is pretty tight with Putin and is in, in a lot of ways maybe more uh, uh, radical, I'll say, than, than Putin is. Now, I I remembered that name because he was such an important character in, in one of the books, whether they talked about him. A few months later, there's a news article. Oh, some like obscure guy in Russia, some Russian politician, some guy that's not that important. His daughter just died in a car bombing. And I'm like, oh, but God, is it? And I look and I'm like, it's Alexander Dugan. You guys killed Alexander Dugan's daughter in a car bomb. You idiot. like, what did you just open up? What is going to happen? And um, it, it seems like, again, by the media coverage, they don't even know who this guy is. And to me, it's like, well, this seems like a major event and you guys don't even know enough to to just write it off like it's not that big of a deal. Um, what is going on with with Ukraine and what has this administration done, if anything? Yeah. Well, on, <laughs> on that latter point, I guess I'll split the difference here. Um, I think you're right that probably most of them have never heard of him. And yet I think at the same time, most of the writing about Dugan that you do get in America um, and his, especially about his relationship with Vladimir Putin and, and all of that, I think is vastly overblown. I can understand that. I you can know, see that too. Yeah. See, the thing is this, man. And this is the book I'm working on now. It's called Provoked, How America Started the New Cold War with Russia and the Catastrophe in Ukraine. Yeah. And and the answer is, it's just the same as with bin Laden. Is they go, oh yeah, no, it's his crazy fundamentalist Islamic beliefs that makes him do this, right? And then they say with Putin, oh yeah, it's this ideological Russian nationalism that he gets from this Dugan guy. No, it's not. It's Bill Clinton and George Bush and Barack Obama and Donald Trump killing people. Yeah. That's what it is. And Joe Biden. That's what it is. It's America's fault. And instead of being honest at all about what they did to cause the crisis, they point at their enemies and they go, oh, yeah, no, see, the Japanese, they worship their emperor. That's why they kamikaze their planes into our ships. It's not to protect their home islands and their family and their community. Yeah. It's because the emperor has them hypnotized through his magical powers of brainwashing. No, it's because our fleet is headed toward their country. You know, come on. Yeah. They yeah. always do that. And, um, you know, they did attack Pearl Harbor, but, you know, again, the Americans provoked it and quite deliberately so. Um, so the thing is that, you know, I'm sure Dugan is important in his way, you know, among right wing intellectual circles in Russia. Yeah. Um, I doubt he has the slightest philosophical influence on Putin at all. Possibly has a political one if Putin, you know, at certain times has felt like, oh, Dugan's influence is on the rise and I better, you know, placate the Dugan likers by throwing yeah. him a bone or something like that. But Putin is a technocrat. Putin is not an ideologue. You know, they go, oh, well, he read some history books and he got all inspired. Come on, man. You know, and I got all the quotes in the book. When when Russia took Crimea, Freed Zachariah from CNN, he said to Barack Obama, he's like, oh, man, it's the rise of Russian nationalism, huh? And they're going to retake everything and take all the things. And Barack Obama goes, listen, man, let me tell you something. There's no grand plan from Vladimir Putin to recreate the Russian empire. Okay. What's happened in Crimea is purely a reaction to the transition of power that we helped accomplish in Kiev. Okay. And then even you'll see Michael McFall, Obama's ambassador to Russia, who's a horrible hawk and just lies and smears all damn day. He said virtually the same thing that like, look, man, you'll hear all of these stories about how Putin is obsessed with recreating the Russian empire and all that. And the yeah. truth is he's reacting to the things that we have done to him. Yeah. You know, that's in their moments of candor. They, what, do you, uh, what do you think about this metaphor that I have used? Tell me if this is a good one. When I explain, when I talk to people about Russia and Ukraine, I say, look, I've got two neighbors across the street that I don't particularly like. 
if I open up my front door someday and I see both of them engaging in a fist fight, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to let them fight it. I don't, I'm not going to run in and, and get between it. I'm not going to send my kids out there to get between them. I'm just going to watch uh, two assholes fight. Is Ukraine and Russia two assholes fighting or no? I mean, is it? Is, yeah, <laughs> could you your analogy, up? what it is, is you knew that the two neighbors over there hated each other. So you started arming up one of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's other, a good point. Then when the other went to fight him, you went, Oh, well, I can't believe that you would ever do such a thing. It must be because you read this guy, Alexander Dugan, and he yeah. changed your ideology. When yeah. no, it was your stupid fault. You went and changed the balance of power. You overthrew the head of the household, and put a new stepdad in charge over there, and started arming him up. Yeah. His next well, neighbor got you know, more worried than before. Exactly. So, and anybody who, if anyone's listening and they've never given this a thought and they're absolutely appalled because they have the Ukraine flag in their Twitter bio, I would say, um, maybe look up how Ukraine was, I believe the sex trafficking hub of the world. If you go back to a couple, there's an article in maybe like 2019, just a couple of years ago, you can read about the sex trafficking mm -hmm. that happens there as well as Most the countries in the world, man. Yeah. As well as the legitimate Nazis, uh, the, the, what is it like the great, great grandkids of Nazis or whatever that are, um, that are over there. So, Hey, I'm not saying that, um, I'm not saying that, uh, e either one is, is good or bad. I'm just saying that I don't really appreciate how much money and funds in the proxy war. And I don't appreciate the fact that I've got friends and family who I love in the military, who, if something pops off could just, you know, could be in Europe. And I don't, I don't mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> yeah. And look, I mean, the fact of the matter is that even the NATO expanders all this time recognize that Ukraine is a very special case. It's extremely divided by language and ethnicity. Yes. Yeah. You know, the the eastern regions of it that are being retaken by Russia now, if they're lucky and get to keep them. Uh, these are regions that had belonged to Russia since the 1780s, since the time of the American Revolution. And... Um, but what had happened was when the Soviet Union was created after the Civil War, Lenin drew the border where he drew it. There's yeah. nothing holy about that border. Those borders have changed over and over and over again. Um, and of course, you know, back before the 1780s, it, it was not all under the control of the Russians. It was under the control of various other, you know, um, you know, whatever yeah. sub nations of, of, uh, different, uh, Slavic groups, you know, during those eras and what have you. But then when the Soviet union broke up, everyone knew that like, well, we're stuck with these kind of wacky communist drawn borders here. And the, the Russian government wasn't in any position to really do anything about it then. But yeah. Yeltsin at one point threatened war over the Donbass then. And so, yeah. listen, we're going to have a very special status for the Donbass because everyone understands this is very Russian territory being left behind inside this country that was, you know, formerly it didn't matter where the border was because they were all answerable to the communist tyranny in the Kremlin, right? Yeah. It was completely centralized authority. And Crimea had belonged to Russia this whole time up until uh, 1954, when after Stalin died, Khrushchev in a power play in order to get support from the Ukrainian Communist Party gave Crimea to Ukraine, but it was purely symbolic. Everybody, again, was answerable only to the Kremlin anyway. Yeah. Oh. You, know, you know, you've mentioned uh, World War II a couple of times here, and I just it's something that I've been kind of looking back at. I had, I saw this book title called uh, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary uh, War. Yeah, you should read that book, young man. I haven't I haven't read it yet, but it just sticks with me. Uh, is that a good one to read to relook at some things? Yeah, that's Pat Buchanan. Um, as I said, Justin Romando is a big Buchananite, and I'm a big fan of the guy too. We've run him at antiwar.com. He only just retired from writing last fall. Really cool guy. Yeah. Um, leader of the paleocons. And that book is not as much about America, as it's about England. It's saying that England should have never fought World War II against Germany. And that if England had just, if they had not given a war guarantee to Poland, then Poland would not have talked so tough to Hitler and would have negotiated that corridor to Danzig, the former German city of Danzig, and war might have been avoided entirely. And yeah. failing that, if they had, uh, the Germans had invaded Poland, 
then they'd have been facing East and they'd have been, uh, you know, the reason that Hitler made his deal with the Soviets was because of British and French hostility, right? Was what made him sign the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and make the deal to divide Poland and then turn West and fight all the Western democracies first, destroy all the Western democracies first, and then end up invading the Soviet Union anyway and having a, the giant apocalypse on the Eastern Front with the Soviets anyway. Only now, the Western democracies are also already completely destroyed and occupied by Nazi troops. So now there's nowhere for Jewish or any other civilians in Eastern Europe to evacuate to. Everybody's just stuck. And, you know, there's this book, uh, Human Smoke, which you should read along with Pat's book. Okay. One of the things he talks about in there is just the absolutely ruthless blockade by the English, where they would not let anybody out of Eastern Europe. And where you had, you know, opportunities to um, evacuate the Warsaw Ghetto and, and other places where Jews were kept captive in the East. And the English just would not, they just like put their foot down. No boats, no ship traffic at all, period, no matter what. And then yeah. you have like the heroes of human smoke are the Red Cross and the Quaker groups who are breaking into Eastern Europe to try to bring food and medicine to the civilians, you know, trapped in, in the, the uh, terrible situation, um, stuck between um, Hitler and Stalin. And, you know, human smoke actually ends with American intervention in the war, I believe. And, yeah. and Hitler's promise that, you know, if the Americans intervene, that's when the total war against Jewish civilians will truly begin and, and their attempt to eradicate uh, all of European Jewry. In other words, because once they knew the Americans were going to join the war, they knew they were going to lose. They knew at that point that they were doomed. Yes. And so um, we're going to go out, we're going to kill every last Jewish civilian we can on the way out was announced as their official policy at that point. So in other words, Pat's saying, you know, people would say, oh, you're against, you know, being in World War II. Oh, you're for the Holocaust. Pat's saying, listen, no war, no Holocaust. The war caused the Holocaust. And, and you know, Churchill's, in other words, look, if you just take Churchill off his pedestal for a second, and just think about him like he never heard of the guy before. He's George W. Bush. He's a complete idiot. He's not a hero. He's a complete idiot. And yeah. it's easy to it's easy to say, oh, well, Hitler was evil. And so he was facing down evil or whatever. But he wasn't smart. Yeah. At the end of the war. So listen, the title of that book, that's that's Churchill's quote. The unnecessary war. That's what Churchill called it. Wow. I didn't know that. Wow. 60 million people were killed. He goes, oh, you know what? We shouldn't have done that. That was stupid. Looks like we stuck the wrong pig. And then yeah. spread communism. And, and guess what? Poland wasn't free at the end of the war. Poland was enslaved all the way through 1990. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, of course, the Reds helped Mao win in the Soviets helped Mao win in China. Who spread the whole Cold War down to, you know, America's war in Vietnam we talked about earlier, America's war in Korea to contain well, the expansion of communism that America and England had just guaranteed the expansion of um, yeah. by by stopping the Germans, uh, you know, path to destroying it. And then the argument, I don't know if Pat makes this argument, but it's, I think, a compelling one that I've read before was that. Nazism as this exclusivist sort of collectivism, it's, you know, all for them and nothing for anyone else. And so it's kind of a self-extinguishing kind of an idea and that once Hitler had died, there would have been enough of a regime change there. We could have dealt with and look, America dealt with all Nazis up to your eyeballs after the war anyway. So don't give yeah. me that crap. Right. I mean, and it wasn't just the rocket program. It was Reinhard Galen and the spies and everything. For that Operation Paperclip, that's a book, right? Have you, yeah. That's right. So um, 
But so in other words, though, uh, the point being that if the Nazis, if the if the English and French had left the Germans alone to go east, they would have had a better shot at destroying the Soviet Union. And then Nazi Germany would have been a spent force anyway and would have fallen apart and not been able to control all of that territory anyway. Whereas yeah. communism, you know, after surviving the clash, communism you know, is almost like a, it's a liberation theology, right? It's, hang on. You're good. It's, you know, communism, like Christianity, basically promises salvation for the lowest soul, right? That like, no matter who you are, no matter if you're the bastard son of an alcoholic from the poorest village on the wrong side of the mountain, it doesn't matter. This is all equality, all everything for everyone. And so- yeah. Not that it delivers, but it has a sales pitch that is far more appealing to people than Nazism ever could be. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it ended up, you know, spreading like wildfire throughout the rest of the 20th century. And, and even to this day, people still believe in it because yeah. it, it promises to be the solution to all unfairness and this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, people attack Pat and say he's pro Hitler or something like that. It's just not the case. And you read the book, the book is written, the, I believe the only sources he quotes in the entire book are the absolutely preeminent historians of Oxford and Cambridge. Yeah. Yeah. You don't like it tough. Yeah. You no. Know? That so let's back it up a second too. I want to relook at World War One. That's always been of interest to me. I I've got the book. Um, I moved it off my shelf, but um, I've got the book called uh, "The War That Ended Peace." Do you have any any either books you recommend with World War One, or any any hot takes there, or, or anything to expand on with World War One? Yeah, well, I mean the the best book that you that people need to read about World War One is Wilson's War by James Powell. Okay, and it's you know it's the cause and effect. It's the enough already of World War One. It's about okay. how. You know, if it hadn't been for World War One, it hadn't been for American entry into yeah. World War One, there would have never been a Soviet Union. There would have never been a Nazi Germany, and yeah, that's called probably World wouldn't have been a World War Two at all. Um, and because American intervention, Wilson, you know, paid the Russian. You know, the original revolution was in March of 1917, and the Kerensky government came into power. But Wilson bribed him to stay in the war, gave him millions of dollars and trucks and boots and guns. And I guess who did you say the author of that was James Powell? Yeah, okay, so Wilson's War How Woodrow Wilson's Great Blunder Led to Hitler, Lenin, Stalin, World War II. Is that the book? That's the book. Okay, um, yeah, I'm gonna check that one out too. That's so if it hadn't have been for Wilson, the who, by the way, just to pause, that asshole is like one of the worst presidents, right? I mean, he 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 had put in that uh, the, he he was super racist, if if I'm correct. There, he put in that that uh, three hour long Ku Klux Klan movie was the first movie ever premiered at the White House because of him. Like Wilson, and wasn't it his wife who also may have been half of that presidency because he was ill? If I'm thinking of the same guy, yeah, yeah, the stroke and his wife. To go. Yeah, I just want to pause because he was a bad Jimmy person, Morgan's but continue. <laughs> Yeah, continuing. I mean, yeah, I mean, look, you could say the first half of his presidency was Colonel Edward Mandel House was in charge, and then the second half was his wife, I guess. Um, but yeah, he signed the Federal Reserve Act into law. Yeah. For some reason, he was against the income tax, but he didn't have a say in that. Um, <laughs> but he, um, and he completely created a fascist economy during the war. Um, you know, in fact, a funny story interesting story about wilson is um and if you go back 20 years this was my name on pirate radio philip drew administrator uh, yeah. and that's a book by colonel house um i don't know if you're familiar with the phrase uh, like if somebody is somebody else's cheney like cheney yeah. was in charge of bush and people would yeah. say that house he was wilson's cheney or, or they would say about Scooter Libby. Scooter Libby is Cheney's Cheney. He's okay. the guy who tells him what to do. This kind of thing, right? Um, so House was was 
Wilson's Cheney and and essentially he secretly arranged American entry into World War One two years before it even happened. And it was called um, Philip Drew, Administrator, A Story of Tomorrow, 1920 to 1935. Is that the book? That's the book. So it was originally published anonymously. It was written in 1910. Funny story. In fact, there's a park in Austin named after him <laughs> down the street from the house that he lived in when he wrote the book. And there's a skate park at the park. So there's literally a skate park called House Park. <laughs> is named after the guy who is the grandfather, essentially, of Hitler, Stalin, the Bushes, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, and every horrible damned thing that happened in the 20th century. Yeah. And kids at the skate park have no idea, and I'm not going to ruin their fun. But anyway, <laughs> um, the house park is named after this guy. And here's what's funny about the book, okay? The book is called Philip Drew Administrator, and it's a novel, and it's a poorly written one but it's a, this fantasy about wouldn't it be great if america was a fascist dictatorship and i was the dictator and so in the story philip drew um exposes this corruption in government and he leads one big decisive battle and against the corrupt u.s government and overthrows it and makes himself dictator of the country and then once he's in there he passes essentially the income tax, um, uh, central banking, inflationary money, and uh, the permanent institutionalization of labor unions and the uh, positioning of government officials on every corporate board and all this stuff. And he's describing fascism. And in fact, later when Mussolini first came out in Italy and he was all the rage and popular in American intellectual circles, House was jealous and said, oh, yeah, well, I anticipated Mussolini by several years. And this is my program for totalitarian fascism to, you know, completely control the economy uh, in the hands of trusted wise men like J.P. Morgan to tell everyone what to do. <laughs> and then. So then once they got in there and once they got their war, they implemented Philip Drew's blueprint, Edward House's blueprint for a totalitarian state during the wartime, uh, during the, all his wartime measures of taking over industry and everything. And then this is the blueprint for a generation later, what became the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt. And, you know, his wife gave him the book. And this was all the same circle. So the joke here then is, well, wait a minute. If the Democrats, since Wilson, 110 years ago, 105 years ago, yeah, if they're the fascists, well, what does that make the Republicans? <laughs> the Republicans, you know, they're just as much or more the servants of big business this whole time. Yeah. You say the Democrats are slightly more violent in their wars, but the Republicans sure champion their wars as well, especially against the Reds. But <laughs> um, yeah. so this is this is the point is that it's been more than 100 years since the American political class abandoned any faith in constitutionalism or the structure of the government uh, as delineated in the Constitution and decided instead to keep it as a decoration only and instead move towards what they then called unembarrassedly unembarrassingly fascism yeah this you know what they they'll tell you in government school it's a mixed economy right well that means that big business controls the government and the government controls big business yeah and yeah they work together to stay at war and to steal from you yeah well yeah there there you go well um, one of my last questions here, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go soon though, Scott, although I could talk to you uh, for hours. I'm having uh, fun. Let me, let me ask you this. I want to know if you've read it and if so, is this your favorite book of all time? Decision Points by George W. Bush. No, I, <laughs> no, I have never read that. In fact, the only quote I even know from there is the one where he's crying about how the CIA debunked his lies about Iran's nuclear program. And how he went and had a meeting with the Saudi king and a bunch of other potentates. And it's just so funny. The guy is so clueless and shameless and yeah. lacking in human dignity that he does not know to be embarrassed to write out this scene 
where he goes before the Saudi king and says, your majesty, I'm so sorry. You got to believe me. The CIA so, really screwed me on this by saying Iran doesn't have a <laughs> nuclear program, but now a nuclear weapons program. But now there's nothing I can do about it. I can't bomb a country when my <laughs> own CIA says they don't have nukes. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that I made them do it so I would have an excuse not to bomb. But it's just not true. I swear. You got to believe me. Your highness. Yeah. While he's laying on his belly, crawling and begging and calling this guy your majesty and your highness and your excellency. Yeah. It's just an amazing scene. And and what's his point? His point is, without the lie, I can't start the war. Yeah. And now what are we talking about? We're talking about the NIE from 2007, which was now 15 years ago. 16 years ago, the CIA said Iran is not making nukes. And guess what? They still don't have any nukes. Yeah. Yeah. CIA was telling the truth, debunking the lie. Yeah. And George Bush goes, oh, wham, your majesty, please forgive me. Because he's the lowest scum. He's lower than the rotting carcass of a dead worm. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been, I've never read it, but I, I think I paid like a buck for it. And it was one of those things of like, man, I don't. I just thought it would be interesting to maybe someday read. And uh, I agree with uh, you. I, you know what? Throw it on the pile. I'll get to it. Maybe yeah. I'm pause well, the world and catch up on all my books. I need to read. Yeah. You know, um, you know, one book I might recommend to you. Um, if you haven't read it yet, um, Saddam Hussein kind of became a, a character uh, who I was pretty intrigued by. And I read this book, uh, The Prisoner in His Palace. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, um, but basically it's just about the American guards and, and him and, and what it was like uh, guarding him. Uh, the author is Will Bardenwerper. I don't even know how to say it. Oh, OK. Will Barden Barden Ripper, but um, it, the guy he interviews all of these American guards who guarded um, Saddam Hussein, and they talk about how he would say, you know, your country's gonna miss me. Um, he wrote poetry for one soldier's wife, you know, because he knew the guy was newly married, and he was like writing poems, and it was just about how he lived, you know, in his cell, and what was. I didn't expect to feel so sad after I finished the book because. Um, all the guards, essentially, from what I remember, um, they basically liked him like they all liked him. And so they had to take him to go get executed. And they said that um, like they were just sad because they felt like they just took some grandpa to go get executed. Right. And um, not that I'm trying to be overly s sympathetic to Saddam Hussein or anything. But what made me sad about the book was that the um, when they when he follows up with what the guards are doing now. I mean, you're you. I was thinking like, wow, these guys were in charge of Saddam Hussein. You know, these are probably high, su highly successful individuals who were put in charge of all this stuff. No, like a couple of them were like homeless or died of a drug overdose. And there wasn't really anything remarkable and anything, you know, crazy, cr you know, impressive that they had done afterwards. They were all like depressed and sad. And when I finished the book, I was actually like pretty bummed out and felt bad for the guys. Well, look, I mean, Hussein was a monster and he'd killed a hell of a lot of people. Yep. Correct. Um, yeah. And the way responsibility works is he was responsible for all that stuff. Yeah. But it's also true that at the time of that war, he was an old man. He wasn't a threat to any of his neighbors and wasn't even really a threat to his own people. You know, um, from what I read about the way Hussein's dictatorship worked in the 90s, he was much more Tony Soprano. Yeah. trying to balance the interests of all these competing factions and families and tribes in his country yeah. rather than Joe Stalin up there just bellowing commands that everyone has to obey or be tortured to death. His day is spent essentially getting this guy's son married to this guy's daughter and this, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Business, the management of factions in the country trying to just hold the damn thing together. Yeah. The idea that he was Hitler and he was going to roll on down to Saudi Arabia and then he was going to monopolize the world's oil supply is going to invade Iran next. And he's going to next thing you know, he's going to be rolling into Berlin. It's just like that time we had to stop Adolf Hitler. Yeah. 
man. It's just absolute nonsense. And they go, oh, well, he killed 400,000 Kurds. Yeah, he killed 400,000 Kurds when he worked for the Ronald Reagan George Bush administration in the 1990s. They helped him do it. Don't give me that crap. And the fact is, and I don't know if this is in the book that you read or not, um, but I've read excerpts from a book from his CIA interrogator who said that at the time of the war, he was writing a romance novel. Yes. He was, he had kicked himself upstairs and was essentially semi-retired and was writing some fantasy about what if he really loved his wife or something like that. Yeah. Was, you know? that Eric, was that Eric Maddox's book, by the way? Uh, Mission I'm Black not sure. I thought, I thought the guy's name was Nixon, um, but I could be wrong. Okay, I, I've got Eric Maddox's book, which I I, th- I thought he was the guy that interrogated. But anyway, yeah, I, I had read that too, that basically he... It was like yeah. writing a romance novel. Whole, look, they knew that they were lying. They didn't have any reason to fear or rock. It was all a deliberate deception. You know, and I explain in the book, essentially, it was centered around the goals of Benjamin Netanyahu from Israel's Likud party, the once and again and now again prime minister of Israel. Um, he was the Iraq hawk, and it was his not just Ariel Sharon, because he and Sharon were partners in the Likud party then, but it was really Netanyahu's faction of Likud, their loyalists in the United States, in the neoconservative movement, were the ones who got us into that war. And they did it because they thought it would be good for Israel. And I guess in a way, like sort of plan B it was, but what they thought was going to happen, you can read about this in a study called A Clean Break, Okay. By David Wormser and Richard Pearl and Douglas Fyth from 1996. And they believed that if they got rid of Sunni Saddam, that that would break the Shiite alliance of Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah. And Hezbollah, of course, being a danger to Israel there in southern Lebanon. So they said, if we get rid of Sunni Saddam it'll break Iran and Syria's power. And here's how it's supposed to work. Once we get rid of Saddam, then the Jordanians will take over the country. And the Jordanians are Hashemites, and they claim the blood of the prophet Muhammad. And the Shiites, well, they're just like automatons or whatever. And so if you just tell them that you have the blood of the prophet in your veins, then they'll just lay right down on the ground and do whatever you say. (laughs) <laughs> so once we get this Hashemite king, we won't have to worry about the super majority Shiite population of Iraq, uh, you know, taking over or allying with Iran or anything like that. No, they will be completely under the sway of the Sunni Jordanian king. And he will tell the Shiite religious leadership in Najaf to tell Hezbollah in Lebanon to stop being friends with Iran. And then they'll make such a wonderful and great society in new Shiite dominated Iraq that it'll put all this pressure on Iran and the Iranian people will be so jealous of the great new Iraqi democracy that then they'll overthrow the Iranian government for us too. And so the the secret to breaking Shiite power in the region is to get rid of Sunni Saddam, the one guy who's holding it back, yeah. right? And so then... That was as stupid as it sounds, of course. And once George W. Bush picked up where his father left off when his father had betrayed that Shiite revolution, once W. Bush took him all the way to Baghdad, as we all know, it was Iran's best friends that succeeded in power. And as soon as they were done consolidating their power, they told George Bush, now get the hell out. Don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. They didn't even say thank you for winning the war for them after eight years. So... Uh, in summary, do you think that the best thing would have been for us to just leave them alone and, and not be not be involved? Yes, they've been begging to come in from the cold. Same thing with Gaddafi. Same thing with the Ayatollah. You know, the mean old Ayatollah died in 1989. We've yeah. been on the second runner-up Ayatollah Khamenei since then. And the guy's perfectly reasonable. And just look at the fact that he hasn't made a single nuke this whole time, if you need proof of how reasonable he is. Yeah. <laughs> he has he's had three different presidents under him, Rafsanjani, Katami, and uh Rouhani. Yeah. Who 
have tried desperately to suck up to the United States of America and to beg to come in from the cold. The Israelis won't have it. And yeah. so Iran remains frozen out. I mean, as you well know, there are plenty of oil companies in America who would just as soon do business with Iran. They don't give a damn. Yeah, of course. Um, there are plenty of interests in America would just as soon. Boeing airplane company would just as soon do business with Iran. But Israel won't allow it. Yeah. Uh, when I said that they benefited in a way, um, I should say that I did see a document from the 80s that said it was an Israeli document or maybe it was an American document describing the Israeli position. I'd have to go back and find it. Some guy said <laughs> archive.org giant cache of documents. Yeah. But anyway, it was the Israelis saying, well, you know, if Iran wins the Iran-Iraq war and they take over Baghdad, even though that would suck because we, you know, are, are worried about Iranian fundamentalist power in a way that would be okay because that would force all the Sunni regimes in the region right into our arms. If Iran and the Shiites got that much more powerful in Iraq. So you could see how if their plan A was getting rid of Saddam Hussein is going to give our friends total sway over the Iraqi people, then plan B is, well, if Iran takes over Iraq, well, that'll just force the Gulf Cooperation Council to compromise with us, which means yeah. they get to keep the West Bank. They get to make peace with the Gulf Arabs without giving justice to the Palestinians. Yeah. And which well, is what happened. And you hear the Trump supporters crowing about the Abraham Accords. Yeah, well, yeah. What are the Abraham Accords? It's a peace deal between uh, UAE and Morocco and uh, who am I leaving out? Was it Qatar? And, um, and Israel, when those countries weren't at war, oh, and Sudan, those countries weren't at war with Israel anyway. They've never been at war with Israel. There's that's no peace point. that's breaking out. All that's <laughs> happening is the Americans at uh, Jared Kushner's scheme is the American people will come up with enough, enough tax money and weapons to bribe these Sunni Arab states to forsake the Palestinians. And they'd always promised they would never, uh, you know, fully normalize relations with Israel until the Palestinians were either given independence or freedom. And yeah. since they get neither, um, then you won't get recognition. But then, yeah. Donald Trump and Jerry Kushner just started passing out billions of dollars, you know, pour it, say when <laughs> the money and you say when, okay, yeah. you'll recognize Israel now. Fine. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, well, Scott, as I said, um, I really could talk to you for hours on this. And I, what I really appreciate with this interview was that you, you, first of all, you always cite your sources and you gave a lot of book recommendations. So people that may not know a lot of this stuff who had a gut level, you know, they just had supported anything America's ever done that they've seen on the news. You know, this is going to give them some things to, to, to second guess, maybe go read and that benefits um, the country because that can help them be a more diligent citizen and and maybe call a, a, a spade a, a spade in the future if something's coming up and maybe hold the government more accountable. So I appreciate what you do. Love to have you on again when uh, when you're when your next out. Um, Scott, thank you for being on. And, and I'll tell everybody too, by the way, uh, follow Scott on Twitter. Um, you're a good Twitter follow as well. <laughs> ah, thanks. And hey, sign up for my show. I got 6,000 interviews for you at scotthorton.org. Scotthorton.org. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. Thanks for coming on. Again, thank you, Scott, for coming on the show. And thank you for listening. Please check out the show notes. I try my best to be as thorough as possible. So everything Scott's affiliated with should be there. And again, go to bookbrain.com. If you go to this episode, you will find every single book that we referenced there. I appreciate it. Again, check out bookbrain.com. Thank you. Bye.